Hi, I'm Chris Potts. This screencast is a review of the technical theory of quantificational determiner meanings that we've been developing in class. These determiners are complicated, and stating the theory involves a lot of notation and concepts. So my primary goal for this screencast is to try to articulate the overall framework, the core guiding ideas. Once you get used to the framework, reasoning in its terms becomes much easier. But it does take some getting used to. So let's get started. This schematic expression here embodies the entire framework. On the left, the debt in double brackets just means that we are specifying the interpretation of debt using the interpretation function, which is what the double brackets are. So we're going from some form debt to a meaning. What's given here on the meaning side is the shape of the meanings that we give to all quantificational determiners. We can read it as the set of all pairs of sets A and B such that blah where the box is the blah part that we need to fill in. A little more slowly, the curly brackets are the usual notation for sets, so that accounts for the set of all. The set we are specifying contains pairs. The angle brackets are the usual notation for specifying pairs, that is, ordered sequences of objects of whatever type. The pairs in question here themselves contain sets, the sets identified here as A and B. Uh, the colon is read such that. It's just a bit of notation for delimiting the place where we specify what kind of objects we're talking about on the left from the condition we want to enforce on those objects on the right. That condition will be spelled out where the box is, and it will be different for different determiners. I think it's helpful at this point to connect with the syntax to the kind of sentences we're analyzing. So here's a simple tree. The tree shows how the two sets A and B given in the definition intuitively connect with pieces of the structure. Uh, the A is the restriction to debt, and the B is the scope for debt. When the debt combines with both of these arguments, we end up with a claim about the world corresponding to this S node in the syntax here. We'll return to the details of composition at the end of the screencast. Let's first look at some examples of the meanings themselves. Here's how we fill out the meaning for every. The constraint that every places on its arguments is that the first is a subset of the second. Uh, this is actually discussed informally in the entailment screencast. Uh, what we're seeing here is just a technical version of those ideas. Here's determiner a, uh, which says that the intersection of its two arguments is non-empty. Uh, here's determiner no, which does the opposite. It says that the intersection of its two arguments is empty. Uh, here's one more. Determiner at least two imposes the requirement that the intersection of its two arguments has at least cardinality two. Now, these vertical lines are the cardinality function. You put any set in, and they say how many members it has. So here we're measuring the cardinality of A intersected with B. For all these meanings, we changed only what was in the black box, the relation specified to hold between A and B. Everything else about the framework remained constant. So we can define lots more of these meanings. As long as it can impose a constraint on pairs of sets, it's expressible in these terms. And in class, we'll define a lot more of these things. But what are these sets of pairs of sets, really? They're awfully complex and massive objects. To get clearer intuitions about what they're like, let's look in more detail at these previous examples, concentrating on the underlying meanings. To do this, I've fully specified the set of all pairs of sets for a small domain, consisting of just two entities, A and B. So this diagram here has a regular structure. In each row, the first member is always the same in each pair. And in each column, the second member is always the same. This gives us the full space of pairs of sets. Determiners then identify subsets of this larger space. Uh, here's every. I've just deleted all the pairs in which the first member is not a subset of the second. So the entire first row remains, because the empty set is a subset of every set. And all the identity pairs along the diagonal remain, because every set is a subset of itself. But for example, this lower left cell here disappeared because the set containing A and B is a superset of the set containing only A, whereas every demands the subset relation. Here's determiner A. It removes all the cases where the two sets have an empty intersection. So the first row and the first column are gone because of the empty set. And pairs like the set containing only A and the set containing only B also disappear because they have an empty intersection. As I said before, determiner no does the reverse of a. All the sets with a member in common are now gone. 
and at least two leaves only one pair because of the unrealistically tiny domain. It's just the lone pair in which the intersection of its two members is two. All determiner meanings impose things like this. Uh, of course, we prefer to work with them at the more conceptual or computational level suggested by the expression at the top of these slides. But I find it's helpful to consider this strictly set theoretic view as well, where we imagine we can specify everything and then cut members based on the constraints imposed by the determiner. As always, we want to know how these meanings interact with other meanings to produce new meanings. That is, we're interested in semantic composition. A bit later in the term, we'll develop a logical grammar to handle these aspects of the phenomena, but the underlying process is easy to capture. Uh, here I have a simple syntactic structure for the sentence debt A's are B's. Uh, more intuitively, here's every student danced. For the semantics, we swap in the meanings, which are sets of various kinds of objects. And then here's how the determiner combines with its restriction. The A argument drops out of the specification, and the meaning goes in for A in the body of the determiner. The result is a set of sets, namely the set of all sets B, such that the students are a subset of B. Finally, the verb phrase comes in by the same sort of process. We drop the B and substitute for B in the body of the expression. The result is intuitively the claim that the students are a subset of the dancers, which is just a slightly awkward way of saying that every student danced.